All right, so very good morning, everyone. Yes. Yes, I hope I am audible and visible to all of you. Yes, Sunil, good morning. Yes, Jason, good morning. Right, so good morning to all of you. So now, let us start with the session on the hemodialysis. So in the previous session, if you see, we have discussed about the chronic renal failure. And in the chronic renal failure, I have discussed about the stages, etiologies, the clinical features, and uh, yeah, so up to, uh, and as well as the complications of the chronic renal failure. That is what we have discussed in the last session. So in this session, we will be discussing about the treatment of chronic renal failure. How do you manage a case of the chronic renal failure? So in this session, I will not just be only uh, talking about the hemodialysis. I will be also discussing about the medical management in case of the chronic renal failure. And in the last session, I was also uh, telling you one more point. What was that I said? Like, uh, if you detect the patient in stage four or stage five, it will be of no use, right? The only option that will be left out for you when you diagnose the patient in stage five will be hemodialysis or renal transplantation. That is kidney transplantation. These are the only two options that will be left out for you if you diagnose the patient in stage five. What should be your efforts? Your efforts should be to pick up the patient in stage one or stage two, and not only diagnosing the patient in stage one and stage two, you should prevent the progression of the disease to stage four or stage five. And for that, what you have to do, all I will tell you, okay? Right. Now, let us start with the hemodialysis. First and foremost, the very important question is, what is the indication of the dialysis? Right? So can anyone make a quick guess what is the indication for dialysis? In the last session also I have discussed. Can anyone tell me what is the indication of dialysis? So if you take the indication of the dialysis, let us be uh, interactive hmm? because everyone got up early in the morning. I definitely appreciate your efforts. But let us be little interactive. So if you are being interactive, you know, like that makes you active in the class. Very good. So who is that? Uh, Saktiveel. Saktiveel said end-stage renal disease. That means what should be the GFR? The dialysis should be considered when glomerular filtration rate is near 10 ml per minute. And there is presence of uremic symptoms. Right? There is presence of uremic symptoms. So these are the ideal indications. Now, apart from that, the other indications, if you see, even when the GFR, right? Even when the GFR is less than 15 ml, right? Even when the GFR is less than 15 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. This is also an indication for dialysis. Actually, there are many indications for dialysis, right? Very good, Ramya. Even uremic uh, pericarditis is also an indication for dialysis. But anyways, I'll be discussing about the indications of the dialysis in detail subsequently. But these are the prime indications. What are those? When the GFR is less than 15 ml per minute per 1.73 meters square is a definitive indication for the dialysis. And the other indications are the individual having severe fluid overload. And actually, how do you treat fluid overload with the diuretics? But here, the individual is unresponsive to diuresis. Right here, the individual is unresponsive to dialysis. That is another indication for dialysis. Hmm? Unresponsive to diuresis. Which particular diuretics do you want to give? Which particular group of diuretics you want to give? Right, you need to, very good Vishnu, you need to give loop diuretics. But I just want to ask you one question here. 
for example, if the individual is having bowel edema, right? If there is GI wall edema, which diuretics you will give Vishnu? Vishnu in loop diuretics, which loop diuretic you want to give Vishnu? <clears throat> you want to give furosemide. Very good. Excellent. Now tell me, if there is GI wall edema, gastrointestinal wall edema, will you give furosemide or some other loop diuretics you want to give? No, 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 no. Potassium sparing diuretics, they are not like uh, high efficacy diuretics. They are not high ceiling diuretics. You, you should give a high ceiling diuretic. So, this is an important question that you all of you have to remember. When there is furosemide, sorry, when there is gastrointestinal wall edema, furosemide is not absorbed across the GAT properly. So, in the presence of the GI wall edema, the ideal drug will be torsamide and bumetanide. Please remember these two points. When there is GI wall edema, furosemide is not absorbed properly. In such clinical scenario, you need to give bumetanide and torsamide. Now, there is another question. Sir, how can I tell that there is GI wall edema? Can anyone tell me how to tell that there is GI wall edema? Hmm? How to tell that there is GI wall edema? Anyone of you, please? Very good, Shiva. So, the individual will have either diarrhea or vomiting. Hmm? Because, yes. So the gastrointestinal absorption is reduced. Hmm? Gastrointestinal absorption is reduced. So that is the reason why the individual will have diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Okay, right. Now, so that is, you need to give bumetanide and as well as torsamide when there is gastrointestinal wall edema. Okay, next. Now, followed by that, we will be discussing about the, we have two forms of dialysis. One is hemodialysis. The other one is peritoneal dialysis. Now, first, let me take up about the hemodialysis. And for doing a hemodialysis, attainment of vascular access is important. First, you need to attain or you need to achieve the vascular access. So, now you see this question. How to attain, right? How to achieve the vascular access for hemodialysis? So, can anyone tell me like how to attain vascular access for hemodialysis? Anyone of you? Very good, uh, Vishnu. One is by fistula. Right? One is by AV fistula. And what is the other option? What are the other method? What is another method by which the vascular access can be achieved apart from AV fistula? Okay, very good, Vishnu. That is the central venous catheter. CVC stands for central venous catheter. And one more. Okay, let me tell you, there are totally three ways by which you can achieve the vascular access. Now, what are those three ways you see here? So, yes, Vishnu, as you are telling the AV fistula, you know, this is your AV fistula. Right? So, you can achieve the access through AV fistula that is one method of attaining or achieving the access. The other method is by graft. Mm, the other method is by graft. And this graft is connected between the artery and as well as the vein. And what is this graft we call it as? We call this as the prosthetic graft. Right? We call this as prosthetic graft. And this will be AV fistula. But between these two, which is more preferable? Can anyone tell me? Between, see, to achieve the vascular access, yeah, okay. So, right. Uh, we have a good question from uh, Paul Jason. So, Jason is asking, sir, in the beginning of the session, you said, if the GFR less than 15 ml per minute itself comprises the first point of GFR less than 10 ml per minute, hmm? less than 10 ml per minute, isn't it? Or these points essentially different, sir? Okay. Let, now, for example, Jason, a very good question, Jason. Uh, for example, if the two options are given to you, like one option is saying 
GFR less than 10 ml per minute, you will do dialysis. Second option, GFR less than 15 ml per minute, you will do dialysis. What the CMDT gives? CMDT is like you, everyone is aware that you we will get a medicine update every year. What the CMDT says is, CMDT says, if the GFR is less than 10, that should be the ideal patient for taking for the dialysis rather than the GFR less than 15. Jason, is that clear, Jason? Ideally, less than 15 you have to take. But the first point what the CMDT says, if the GFR is less than 10, you take that patient to the dialysis first rather than the patient having the GFR less than 15. Okay? Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, yes. So, now we have two forms of, these are, you know, these are not temporary vascular access. These are the permanent vascular access. Hmm? These are the permanent vascular access. See, the vascular accesses, right, you can achieve by two methods. One is your, the vascular access, it can be achieved by two ways. Now, what are those two ways of achieving the vascular access is, we have permanent methods of achieving the vascular access. Then we have temporary methods of achieving the vascular access. Out of which the permanent methods are by AV fistula, and second is the prosthetic graft. Right, second is the prosthetic graft. And where is this graft placed between? The, this particular graft is placed between the artery and vein. Right, this particular graft is placed between artery and vein. Okay, that, they are the permanent methods. Whereas a temporary method of achieving the vascular access it is by central venous catheter, right? It is by central venous catheter. Now, let me show you all the vascular accesses. Now, out of which <clears throat> you see, this is your AV fistula and this is your prosthetic graft. Prosthetic graft is the one which is placed between the artery and as well as vein. But between these two, which are more preferred or which is more preferred, your AV fistula is more preferred than compared to that of your prosthetic graft, right? Compared to prosthetic graft, AV fistula is more preferred, right? Next. Now, why is it more preferred? I will tell you. Hmm? Why is it more preferred? I will tell you the advantages and disadvantages. And what is the temporary method? You see another question. So, temporary method is by placing indwelling catheters, right? Why indwelling catheters should be considered as a temporary measure? I'll tell you, indwelling catheter means what? Placing the central venous catheter, okay? So when will you keep the indwelling catheter is? Indwelling catheter is used when there is no usable vascular access, right? When there is no usable vascular access, then, right, then we use this indwelling catheters. But we don't use this indwelling catheters for long term, right? We don't use this indwelling catheters for long term. Now the question is why, right? Now the question, that is because, these catheters, very good, very good, Ramya, because these catheters, they are, you know, iatrogenic infections are very common, right? The chance of infections are very common with this, with this indwelling catheters. So that is the reason why these indwelling catheters are just only used as the temporary measure only. They are not the permanent methods. And you see the example of the indwelling catheter. Yes, you see. This is the example of the indwelling catheter. You can see that here. 
right? So where the catheter is placed within the jugular vein. Okay. Now, now I said you to achieve the vascular access, we have three methods, right? One is AV fistula, second is prosthetic graft, third is the indwelling catheter, that is central venous catheter. Now, the next question is, which type of, right, the next question is, which type of vascular access will last longer? Huh. I have, I said you three catheters now. Tell me, which type of vascular access will last longer? Is it AV fistula? Is it prosthetic graft? Or is it the indwelling catheter. Very good, Ramya. So it is your AV fistula. Right? It is your AV fistula that will last longer. Right? That will last longer. But we have one particular disadvantage with the AV fistula. We have one particular disadvantage with the AV fistula. What is that? I will tell you. See, the time required for maturation. AV fistula, where is it play, placed? It is play, so, can anyone tell me in between which vessels the AV fistula is being created? Between which vessels the AV fistula is being created? So, AV fistula in the sense, arteriovenous fistula. Very good. So, the AV fistula, it is being created, okay? Yes. AV fistula, it is most commonly created between radial artery and as well as the cephalic vein. Okay? Right now, you know, whenever you create the fistula, immediately we cannot use the fistula. It requires some time for the maturation of that particular fistula, and it requires some time for maturation of the prosthetic graft. Okay, so now another question What is the time required for maturation of the vascular axis? See, for AV fistulas. The time required for maturation, it will be around six to eight weeks. Whereas for the prosthetic grafts, right? Whereas for the prosthetic grafts, it takes only two weeks for the maturation. That is the advantage of the prosthetic graft. But which type of vascular access we will sustain for longer time, that is your AV fistulas, which will sustain for the longer time. Okay, that is the advantage of the AV fistulas. But what is the advantage of prosthetic graft? For the maturation of the prosthetic graft, we can attain or we can achieve the maturation within two weeks, right? Within two weeks, we can achieve the maturation. Which one? The prosthetic graft. Now, you should know what is the name of this AV fistula, okay? Yeah. Can anyone tell me what is the name of this AV fistula? What is the name of the arteriovenous fistula? Very good, very good. I sh and some of you have made a very good attempt. That is called Simino Brescia fistula. Now, why is it called this Seminobrisia fistula is because, right, because it is placed or it is prepared by an Italian doctor and the name of that Italian doctor is Seminobrisia, right, the name of that Italian doctor is Seminobrisia. And that is the reason why it is given the name Seminobrisia fistula. Hmm? That is the reason why it is called Seminobrisia fistula. Now, I just want to ask you a quick question to all of you. Why should we create the fistula? Yes. 
why should we create a fistula any one of you actually you know like it is not like we put one catheter yes very good pavitra durai so it is for arterialization of the veins right so why do we create the fistula is that is for arterialization of veins we create this particular fistulas now what do you understand by this word arterialization of the veins right what do you understand by this word arterialization of the veins let me explain you hmm? this is an important concept that you have to understand just give me one minute i'll show you one important image and then i'll explain so yes yeah you see this image so whenever we are doing dialysis what is that we do we connect two catheters to the vein it is not that we connect one catheter to the artery and one connected one connected to vein it's not like that so one catheter see this is your cephalic vein one catheter through one catheter which is connected consider this is number 1 from this the blood is taken out and it is sent to the dialyzer machine and dialyzer, dialyzer machine will purify the blood and the blood is again sent back and do you think that the blood which is sent back is connected to the artery no even that is also connected to the vein itself right you take the point position point 2 right two is another place within the vein where the catheter is connected now sir you are taking the blood from the vein and you are again sending the blood into the vein itself then in such case why are you creating the fistula why are you creating the fistula yes very good prakalya so you are taking the large amount of blood you know how much amount of blood you will be taking out of the vein within that 4 to 5 hours of dialysis you will be taking almost like 4 to 5 liters of the blood and then sending again to the same vein so this particular vein can undergo phlebitis right there is chance of inflammation of the vein there will be phlebitis of the vein so in order to prevent this phlebitis so what you have to do you have to prevent this phlebitis so in order to prevent the phlebitis what you need to do is you need to create an av fistula when you create an av fistula what happens the pressure which is there in the artery is transmitted to the vein right the pressure which is there within the artery is transmitted to the vein and thereby even the vein it becomes thick right even the vein it becomes thick so that is called as the arterialization of the vein and now this particular vein can sustain the large quantity of the blood okay now it it can take that large quantity of the blood which is being sent from the dialyzer machine that is the purpose of creating the av fistula i hope everyone has understood this yes just please tell me whether all of you have understood why to create the av fistula or not okay good now after having said this right maturation part i have discussed and name of the av fistula i have discussed yes this is another question in which type of vascular access the complications are more 
is it in av fistulas the complications more or is it in the graft the complications are more this is another important multiple choice question let me tell you the complications are more in the grafts that is prosthetic graft rather than av fistula right in the prosthetic grafts the complications will be more than compared to that of av fistula please write that it's a very important point next now another question is when you are considering the complications are more in the graft okay what is the most common cause of soft tissue infection what is the organism which will cause the soft whenever you are keeping the graft you know the anticipated complication is the infection now what is the most common cause of soft tissue infection what is the organism which is present in the skin which will be transmitted into the graft and will cause soft tissue very good who is that Vish vishnu has answered very good vishnu that is staphylococcus species hmm? that will be the most common cause of soft tissue infection and as well as the bacteremia right now having said this you should know how frequently the dialysis has to be done in patients with end stage renal disease so in patients with end stage renal disease the treatment at a hemodialysis center occurs almost three times a week that means every alternate day he has to attend that particular hemodialysis center and once the patient attends i hope i am giving adequate time for you people to write and even if you are not able to write also at the end of the session i will share this presentation to you right just give me a reminder i will share this presentation to you at the end of the session even if you are not able to write okay don't worry if you are able to write or not write definitely i will share the presentation next now the next important question is how much time does a session of the hemodialysis will last can anyone tell me how much time does a session of the hemodialysis will last see the hemodialysis session it will last for nearly around 3 to 5 hours right and it all depends upon the size of the patient and it all depends upon the type of vascular access right type of the vascular access okay that will be around 3 to 5 hours next another very important question is whenever you are doing hemodialysis right whenever you are doing hemodialysis what is the most common complication of hemodialysis can anyone answer what is the most common complication of the hemodialysis see you are taking out the very good ramya so that will be your hypotension so what is that you are doing you are taking large volume of the blood to the dialyzer machine when you are taking out the large volume of the blood and sending it to the dialyzer machine the fluid volume in the individual reduces and that makes the individual to land up in hypotension hmm? that makes the individual to develop hypotension okay next now another important point is what is the most common complication of recurrent hemodialysis what is the most common complication of recurrent hemodialysis most common complication of recurrent hemodialysis please write that that is accelerated atherosclerosis right accelerated atherosclerosis so that will be the most common complication of recurrent hemodialysis and we have few more complications in hemodialysis which we will discuss later but before that you take the peritoneal dialysis now what is the principle in hemodialysis and all i will discuss i will discuss when i am discussing the differences between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis what will be the principle that i will teach you okay but before that you see the peritoneal dialysis you should know in the peritoneal dialysis right in the peritoneal dialysis what is the dialyzer in peritoneal dialysis anyone what is acting as a dialyzer in 
the peritoneal dialysis. Let me tell you, within the peritoneal dialysis, very good. Who is that Prakalya? Very good Prakalya. It is the peritoneal membrane. Right? It is the peritoneal membrane which is acting as a dialyzer. Okay? So this will be your peritoneal membrane. So you can see that here. Right? It is a peritoneal membrane which acts as the dialyzer. Now, what is the procedure? Right? What is the procedure for the peritoneal dialysis? What is that you will do? So first, the dialysate, you see this is the dialysate. That is dialysis solution we call it as. Right? Dialysate is instilled into the peritoneal cavity. You see this is the peritoneal cavity. Into this peritoneal cavity, the dialysate is instilled into the peritoneal cavity through an indwelling catheter. Right? Through an indwelling catheter. So, once the dialysate enters into the peritoneal cavity, Right, once the dialysate enters into the peritoneal cavity, the water and solutes, they move across the capillary bed and these water and solutes, right, they move across the capillary bed and these water and solutes, which move across the capillary bed, lies between viscera and parietal layers of the membrane. Right? These water and solutes, they lie between viscera and parietal layers of the membrane. Right? Parietal layers of the membrane. So what will happen now? The water and solutes from the viscera and the parietal layers of the membrane, they enter into the dialysate. Right? They enter into the dialysate. Which one? Excess amount of the fluid and excess amount of the solute. They enter into the dialysate. And through an outflow catheter, right? You see, this is an outflow catheter. Through outflow catheter, that excess fluid and that excess solute is taken out into the bag. This will be a waste fluid, right? This will be the waste fluid. That is the procedure for peritoneal dialysis. I'll repeat again. Dialysate is instilled into the peritoneal cavity through an indwelling catheter. Once the dialysate enters into the peritoneal cavity, the water and solutes, it moves across the capillary bed. And where will this water and solutes lie? they lie between the viscera and parietal layers of the membrane. So, from there, the water and solutes, they are taken out into the waste fluid bag. That is the procedure for the peritoneal dialysis. Right? That is a procedure for peritoneal dialysis. Now, followed by that, the next important question that you need to know is whenever you are doing peritoneal dialysis, what is the most common complication of the peritoneal dialysis? Can anyone tell me? The most common complication of peritoneal dialysis. Very good, very good, superb. Everyone is answering. I appreciate that. That is peritonitis. So peritonitis is the most common complication of the peritoneal dialysis. Now, how will you diagnose? Right? What will be the clinical features of the peritonitis? How will you tell that the individual has developed peritonitis? That is, the individual will develop manifestations like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain will be there. The individual will also have fever. And there will be diarrhea or constipation. Right? There will be diarrhea or constipation. So, the most common complication of peritoneal dialysis is peritonitis. And what will be the clinical features of peritonitis? These are the clinical features. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea or constipation. That will be the most common complication of the peritoneal dialysis.
right next now these are the clinical features mm, these are the clinical features very much accepted but how do you diagnose peritonitis right how do you diagnose peritonitis how do you diagnose peritonitis is the dialysate it becomes cloudy right the dialysate it becomes cloudy and when you do a peritoneal fluid analysis right when you do the peritoneal fluid analysis the peritoneal fluid will show the wbcs uh, how many wbcs that will be more than 100 cells per microliter right that will be more than 100 cells per microliter and out of this 50 percentage of them will be neutrophils right 50 percentage of them will be neutrophils that is how you will diagnose peritonitis okay so the dial said it appears cloudy and when you do a peritoneal fluid analysis you will have the presence of wbcs of more than 100 cells per microliter right and out of which the 50 percentage of the cells will be the neutrophils and another thing is you need to do culture and sensitivity right another thing is you need to do culture and sensitivity that is how you will diagnose the peritonitis right and the next important question is right the next important question is what is the most common organism causing peritonitis can anyone answer this what is the most common organism no 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 see uh, ramya you are talking about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis of e uh, cirrhosis of liver in cirrhosis of liver yes it is your e coli but whereas here it is you are sending a catheter through the skin of the individual into the peritoneal cavity so the organism is staphylococcus aureus who is that prakalya very good prakalya that will be staphylococcus aureus that will be the most common infecting organism now apart from the staphylococcus aureus the other organisms will be streptococci and then gram negative species may also be causative but the most common will be staphylococcus aureus hmm? the most common will be staphylococcus aureus chalo theek hai now you have diagnosed peritonitis peritonitis is there in the individual now now what is that you will do now right what is that you will do what is the treatment for peritonitis in patients who are undergoing the peritoneal dialysis what you need to do you need to do intraperitoneal administration of vancomycin right intraperitoneal administration of vancomycin or the other alternative right the other alternative is you need to give a first generation cephalosporin and what is that first generation cephalosporin that first generation cephalosporin is cefazoline plus along with the first generation cephalosporin you also need to instill the third generation cephalosporin and what is the third generation cephalosporin that is ceftazidim okay so this should be the antibiotic that have to be instilled into the peritoneal cavity for development of peritonitis in case of the peritoneal dialysis right so this is about the most common complication in hemodialysis hypotension 
most common complication of peritoneal dialysis, that is peritonitis. Now, now let me discuss the differences between what are the other complications also I will teach you, right. Let me discuss the differences between the peritoneal dialysis and as well as the hemodialysis. Now, the rate at which you will do that di peritoneal dialysis, it is slow. Right? Whereas the rate at which you will do hemodialysis is fast. Okay? And where it can be done, peritoneal dialysis can be done even at the home. Whereas hemodialysis, it should be done only in the hospital. Right? It should be done only in the hospital. Right? And you take in peritoneal dialysis. How is the ultrafiltrate taken out? Right? How is the ultrafiltrate taken out? That is by osmotic pressure. Via dextrose dialysis. Right? Via dextrose dialysis. So what is that we will do? I said you the methodology. Procedure of peritoneal dialysis. We need to instill the dialysis. What is the dialysis? That is nothing but your dextrose dialysis. We, we instill the dextrose solution. And into this particular dextrose solution, the solutes are taken out and they, via the osmotic pressure. And even the fluid is taken out into the dextrose solution via the osmotic pressure. And then it is thrown into the waste bag through another catheter. Whereas in the hemodialysis, the ultrafiltrate removal, it is by hydrostatic pressure. Right, it is by hydrostatic pressure. And how does the solute removal occurs? The same, that is your concentration gradient. That means the solute will move from high concentration gradient area to the low concentration gradient area. That is how the solute is removed. Both in either you take peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. Ultrafiltrate means what? Ultrafiltrate is excess fluid which is taken out. Solute removal is the waste substances. That is your creatinine, urea. Taking out that is nothing but your solute removal. So in peritoneal dialysis, what is a membrane? Peritoneum itself is a membrane. Whereas in hemodialysis, we have semi-permeable artificial membrane. Right? Semi-permeable artificial membrane, where in case of the hemodialysis. And what is the methodology that we will follow? In case of peritoneal dialysis, the indwelling catheter Indwelling catheter is placed in the peritoneal cavity. That is the method of the peritoneal dialysis. Whereas if you take hemodialysis, we create a line from artery to vein. Okay. So these are the differences between the peritoneal dialysis and as well as the hemodialysis. Right? The advantages of the peritoneal dialysis is that that, they, that can be done in the home. And it is an easy method by which you can do the peritoneal dialysis. Whereas hemodialysis, that has to be done only in the hospital. And that is little expensive and little tedious procedure, which one, the hemodialysis. Okay? But most of the times, many of the patients with the chronic renal failure do take the hemodialysis because they are it worry of the peritoneal dialysis related peritonitis, right? But the easier method of getting the dialysis done is your peritoneal dialysis. Now, let me just show you one question. Yeah. Indication of dialysis is all except pericarditis, 
persistent hyperkalemia, uremic encephalopathy, severe respiratory acidosis. Very good, Aisha. Excellent, Aisha. Why, Aisha? Why D is not your answer? Yes, Vishnu. Prakalya. Why not the D be the answer? Let me tell you, dialysis should be done when there is severe metabolic acidosis, not respiratory acidosis. Right, should be done when there is severe metabolic acidosis, not the respiratory acidosis. Whereas all these are the indications, uremic pericarditis, persistent hyperkalemia, and then uremic encephalopathy. I'll just show you a table. I'll just show you a table of the indications of the dialysis. Yeah, this is the table of indications of dialysis. If you're able to write, fine, but otherwise I'll be sending you the PPT. I mean, I'll be sending you the presentation after the class, okay? Uremic pericarditis. Uremic pericarditis, what will be the presentation? The patient will present with chest pain. Hmm? Pericarditis, where there is inflammation of the pericardium. So there will be uh, inflammation of the pericardium causing the chest pain. And accelerated hypertension, that too refractory. You will be giving antihypertensives, but still the blood pressure is not reduced. Then in such case, you need to do dialysis. Why there is hypertension? That is because of the fluid overload. Okay, next. The third one is volume overload, unresponsive to medication. Actually, we give high ceiling diuretics like furosemide. And that furosemide, what it has to do, it has to excrete that volume overload. But here the kidneys are not functioning. What is the role of, or what is the use of giving furosemide? So when the individual is refractory to your low diuretics, that is the point when you need to do the dialysis. Volume overload, unresponsive to medication. And next, hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia, unresponsive to medications. What is the drug of choice for hyperkalemia? What is the drug of choice for hyperkalemia? Any one of you? Very good, Vishnu. You need to give, not insulin, not insulin, Ramya. It is calcium gluconate. Hmm? It is calcium gluconate. That will be the drug of choice. Okay, so, and we have many other drugs for hyperkalemia. One is calcium gluconate, insulin plus dextrose solution then salbutamol nebulization, then potassium binding resins, hmm, that is sodium polystyrene sulfonate, right? And these are the various methods by which you can reduce that hyperkalemia. But if the individual is unresponsive to medication, then you have to do the dialysis. Then severe metabolic acidosis, unresponsive to medication. What is the medication that you will give for metabolic acidosis? Yes, what is the medication that you will give for metabolic acidosis? Hmm? Yes, you need to give sodium bicarbonate solution. But if the individual is unresponsive to your sodium bicarbonate, hmm? if the individual is unresponsive to your sodium bicarbonate, that is the point when you need to do dialysis. Then the neurological signs or symptoms of uremia, that is uremic encephalopathy. So what will be the features of uremic encephalopathy? Already I have discussed when I was discussing chronic renal failure. Okay, that is altered sensorium. The individual can have seizures. There will be presence of flapping tremors or astrexis. All that will be the features of the uremic encephalopathy. Okay, then clinically significant bleeding diathesis. Why there will be clinically significant bleeding diathesis? Yes, why there will be clinically significant bleeding diathesis in the individual? Any one of you? why there is bleeding diathesis in a patient with a chronic renal failure. I have taught you this. Very good, Prakalya. So, in chronic renal failure patient, there will be decrease in the platelet function. So, because of decrease in the platelet function, right, because of decrease in the platelet function, the individual can have bleeding diathesis and at which you need to do chronic renal failure. I mean, at which you need to do dialysis in chronic renal failure. Then, coming to persistent nausea and as well as vomiting. Why does this patient has nausea and vomiting? Why does the patient have nausea and vomiting? That is because of uremic gastroparesis. Hmm? That is because of uremic gastroparesis. You need to do, yeah, you need to do the dialysis. Hmm? That is nausea and vomiting. And lastly, increase in your nitrogenous waste products. That is, when the plasma creatinine is more than 1060 micromoles per liter and blood urea nitrogen more than 36 millimoles per liter. 
So these are the absolute indications for dialysis in chronic renal failure. Okay, now you see another question. What are the contraindications for dialysis? Can anyone tell me what are the contraindications for dialysis? Yes. The contraindications for dialysis is that those individuals who had undergone recent abdominal surgery or the individual who has undergone recent cardiothoracic surgery. That is number one. And number two, in those individuals where there is diaphragmatic peritoneal pleural connection, right, diaphragmatic peritoneal pleural connection, Right. So in this scenario, you should not do dialysis. Hmm? Recent abdominal or cardiothoracic surgery or in those individuals who have diaphragmatic peritoneal pleural connection. Right. Next. Then you see some questions. Yeah. What is the most common cause of death in dialysis patient? What is the most common cause of death in dialysis patient? Very good. So that will be due to a cardiovascular complication. Hmm? That will be due to cardiovascular complication. You know, what is that I have taught you? The most common complication will be hypotension and most common recurrent complication will be accelerated atherosclerosis. And as a part of accelerated atherosclerosis, the individual can develop coronary artery disease and then develop myocardial infarction. Next. Most common cause of death Right, most common cause of death in patients on dialysis for acute renal failure, for acute renal failure, cardiovascular infection, malignancy, anemia. Very good. Who is that? Prakalya. Very good, Prakalya. So that is infection. Most common cause of death. Achha, okay. Good. So, most common cause of death in patients on dialysis for acute renal failure will be infection. Okay. Whereas, you see another question. Most common cause of death in chronic dialysis patient is Right, so, okay, so 28 people have answered and out of that, 20 people have answered A, that is cardiovascular, okay, so the answer is the cardiovascular, so most common cause of death in chronic dialysis patient will be of cardiovascular, that is nothing but your accelerated atherosclerosis, just now whatever we were discussing, so these are the causes of death. And you should know what are the other complications of dialysis. We have only discussed the most common complications and recurrent com what will be the complication whenever you do a recurrent hemodialysis. And the other complications are dialysis dementia. Now, why does the dialysis dementia occur? That is due to accumulation of amyloid beta 2 protein within the brain. Hmm? Amyloid beta 2 protein within the brain. Please tell me, what is another disorder where you have beta amyloid blocks in the extracellular area causing dementia? Very good, Aisha. That is Alzheimer's. And this beta amyloid blocks are extracellular accumulations in Alzheimer's. Now, Aisha, can you tell me, what are the intracellular accumulations in Alzheimer's? What are the intracellular accumulations in Alzheimer's? Very good. Very good, Vishnu. That will be your NFT, that is neurofibrillary tangles, which are nothing but tau proteins, which are called tau patis. Hmm? Intracellular accumulation will be neurofibrillary tangles. Extracellular accumulation will be your beta amyloid blocks. 
Okay, next. The another complication is this amyloid beta 2, this can get accumulated within the flexor retinaculum, causing the carpal tunnel syndrome, right, where there is median nerve compression. And there is one important vitamin which is lost during dialysis in the filter. And what is that important vitamin that is being lost? That is vitamin B7, which is nothing but the panthothenic acid. So when the panthothenic acid is being lost, what the complication the individual will develop? That is burning feet syndrome. Hmm? That is burning feet syndrome. And the other complications are adynamic osteomalacia due to vitamin D deficiency and then myopathy. So these are all the other complications, right? This completes the discussion of the entire topic of dialysis. But at the end, within five minutes, let me just tell you, I will send you the PPT. Now itself, I will send you the presentation. Don't worry if you have not written the slides. Yes, you need to know what is the medical management for the chronic renal failure. Yes. So you take the medical management in patients with a chronic renal failure. First and foremost, what is the most common cause of chronic renal failure? What is the most common cause of the chronic renal failure? The most common, yes, very good, uh, Pavitra. The most common, and as well as Venkat, yes, all of you now. So diabetes mellitus is the most common cause. So whenever you are managing a patient of chronic renal failure, you have to ensure that HbA1c should be maintained less than 7%. And how is that you will maintain the HbA1c less than 7%? That is by giving insulin. So insulin has to be administered in order to maintain the HbA1c of less than 7%. Then the blood pressure control. And how will you achieve the blood pressure control? That is by giving AC inhibitors or calcium channel blockers. But again, when the serum creatinine is more than two, right? When the serum creatinine is more than two, these AC inhibitors, they are avoided. And in such case, how will you maintain the blood pressure? That is by giving only calcium channel blockers, you need to maintain the blood pressure. Next. The another important point is cholesterol should be under control because these individuals, you know, lipoprotein lipase activity is reduced. So when lipoprotein lipase activity is reduced, there is dyslipidemia or hyperlipidemia. So how will you correct the dyslipidemia or hyperlipidemia? You need to give statins. And you have to ensure that low density lipid LDL should be less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Hmm? LDL should be less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. So diabetic control, blood pressure control, and then statins. And these patients, they are deficient of vitamin D. Hmm? Vitamin D synthesis is decreased. So you need to supplement, right? You need to supplement vitamin D in these individuals. And the another important substance is you need to give sinacalcet. What is the purpose of giving this sinacalcet? See, whenever there is vitamin D synthesis is being decreased, the individual will suffer with what is called the hypocalcemia. So whenever there is hypocalcemia, what will happen immediately? There will be release of parathormone. Right? There will be release of parathormone. So, how will you prevent the parathormone release from the parathyroid gland? You have to give sinacalcet that prevents the release of parathormone. Right, that prevents the release of parathormone. Which one? The sinacalcet. See, what is the problem whenever the parathormone is released? the individual will end up in renal osteodystrophy. We don't want that renal osteodystrophy to be developed. So we will prevent the parathormone release by giving sinacalcet. And I said you that these individuals will have anemia. And for treating anemia, you need to give the erythropoietin supplementations. And what is that erythropoietin supplementation that you will give? 
that is epoidin alpha and as well as the dark b poitin alpha so this epoidin alpha and dark b poitin alpha let me tell you they have to be administered through subcutaneous route right they are administered through subcutaneous route and what will be the most common adverse effect of this erythropoietin formulations the most common adverse effects of the erythropoietin formulation will be hypertension very good ramya that will be hypertension okay so this is about the medical management in patients with the chronic renal failure okay right so i hope everyone has understood this topic of hemodialysis okay and la last one more point you should not miss what did i tell you you have to detect the patient in stage 1 and you have to prevent the progressions to stage 4 or stage 5 and i asked you people how to achieve you have to see that ac inhibitors are given to reduce the proteinuria okay whatever i am telling you now that will prevent the progression of the disease and you have to see that the blood pressure has to be maintained less than 130 by 80 and pro if proteinuria is less than 1 gram and less than 125 by 75 if proteinuria is more than 1 gram per day and for that you need to give the anti hypertensives like calcium channel blockers yeah yes sindhuja hmm? this is the slide this is the question what you are asking me now hmm? this is the question yes sindhuja blood pressure should be less than 130 by 80 if the proteinuria is less than 1 gram and the blood pressure should be less than 125 by 75 if proteinuria is more than 1 gram per day that is the target blood pressure that has to be maintained in crf patients to prevent the progression of the disease and sindhuja did you understand that sindhuja now the next thing, important thing is the protein restriction how much protein you have to give you have to give 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kg per day that should be the protein restriction so if you give more protein there is more protein urea that can cause the progression of the disease and glycemic control hba1c should be maintained less than 7% and cholesterol lowering therapy that is by giving statins actually ldl is not 100 the recent guidelines says it should be less than 70 mg per deciliter that is according to the recent guidelines and anemia correction by giving erythropoietin supplementation you have to maintain the target blood pressure of 10 to 12 and already these patients are the fluid overload so salt restriction has to be done that is you need to give 3 to 5 grams of salt per day 3 to 5 grams of salt per day smoking has to be completely stopped then weight control is very very important right and then you need to reduce elevated calcium phosphate right there is hyperphosphatemia in patients with chronic renal failure and this increased phosphate will form the complex with the calcium resulting in calcium phosphate so you need to reduce this elevated calcium phosphate and you need to avoid the nephrotoxic products or nephrotoxic drugs so when you can do this you can prevent the progression of the patient from stage 1 to stage 5 that is about the treatment strategies in chronic renal failure okay so the summary of the class is that hemodialysis two methods sorry dialysis two methods hemodialysis peritoneal dialysis and you take hemodialysis you can achieve the vascular access by three methods one is temporary method that is indwelling catheter which we place in the central venous catheter jugular vein and the remaining two are the permanent methods what are those permanent methods one is your graft that is prosthetic graft and two what is that second one the second one is the av fistula av fistula is more advantageous than compared to that of the graft why because the av fistula the it will last for longer time then compared to that of your graft that is prosthetic graft okay and later on what did i tell you the most common complication of hemodialysis is hypotension and recurrent hemodialysis accelerated atherosclerosis and what is the principle that is being used the principle that is the membrane is an artificial membrane right that is now the principle is very good actually 
image you will understand. Yes. So this is the membrane. Hmm? This is the membrane. Yes, this is the right. This is the membrane. So the so the solute from the blood enters into the dialysis across this artificial membrane. Right. So the principle which is being used is the hydrostatic pressure. Okay. And then followed by that, we have discussed about the peritoneal dialysis, where peritoneum is used as a dialyzer. And most common complication is peritonitis, and most common organism is Staphylococcus aureus. And treatment is you need to give vancomycin, or you need to do the installation of first and third generation cephalosporin. Okay, right. So that completes the discussion of the hemodialysis and everything. So yes, were you able to follow the session? Yes, were you able to follow the session? Okay, so please just give me a quick feedback. How was the class? So that it will help me for further sessions. Yes, see the principle is very simple. The principle is that the preferred, okay, one, one by one, one by one. The principle is very simple. That is the solute will move from high concentration area to the low concentration area. The dialysate contain low concentration of the solute. The blood contain high concentration of the solute. So the solute will move from high concentration area in the blood to the low concentration area in the dialysate. That is the basic principle. Okay, right. And, and preferred vein for central venous catheter access. The preferred vein for central venous catheter access will be jugular vein. Who was that who was asked? Yes, Sunil. Hmm? Yes, Sunil from Coimbatore, right? That is, the jugular vein will be the preferred uh, access, okay? Right, now I'll just upload the file for you all. Just give me one minute. Just one minute, I'll upload the file right away so that it will be easy for you because later on, again, I will forget, you will also forget. So just revise the topic. Once I send the file to you, you can download the file right away. Yes. Yeah, so the file is sent successfully. So you can just download the file. All right. Usually, uh, yes, Nitya Devi, the hypertension is less common during dialysis. If there is a hypertension, it is, you know, Reactive hypertension, hmm? reactive hypertension, because the fluid is being taken out through the dialysis, the blood volume decreases. So the sympathetic nervous system, it overreacts. That is called reactive hypertension. Yes, Nitya Devi, is that clear? That we call reactive hypertension. Okay, right. So we will, we will wind up this session now, right? Thank you very much. 